Zoom because they record things so I can put it on YouTube later. All right. That should do it. Yep. Okay. It's hopefully recording this stuff for those who are not physically present. Anyway, uh, for those who are physically present, let me tell you what we're going to do here. So get on the internet. Here's the instructions. It really is blank at blank.com. Um, and once you're on the internet, go to samsclass.info. And you can have any kind of computer because we're going to put everything in the cloud. I used to use virtual machines, and uh, six months ago, um, my students started having trouble, and perhaps some of you noticed VMware stopped working six months ago on Windows 10. Um, a large proportion of my students could not get Windows 10 to work at all um, with virtual machines because of the high resolution issue. Um, modern laptops, laptops less than about two years old, have high resolution, so the virtual machines, you have only two choices. It's either shrunk down to where you need a microscope to see it, or the mouse and the keyboard doesn't work. And there was no solution to this for six months, as far as I could tell, um, except to go to really old versions of Windows 10 where you block the updates, which as far as I can tell is the only good way to use Windows 10. Um, or if you have Windows 7 or something. But anyway, they finally fixed it with the latest version of VMware. But for about six months, we couldn't. And that motivated me. I said, well, you know, usually when something like that happens, I spend a little time being mad at them and finding workarounds. And I said, well, you know, virtual machines are pretty much over anyway. Why am I wasting my time on this? My students are learning this useless skill of running desktop virtualization like VMware and VirtualBox, which is of no use in the industry. And they're going through great contortions to debug that. And I say, why are they doing any of this? Nobody uses that. What they use is cloud machines. I said, can I just put all my stuff in the cloud? About three years ago, I had a big complicated workshop with Android security audit and repeat to run Android virtual machines. And it was a real hard thing to get the lab set up. And Doug Smidler came and he said, this should all be in the cloud. And I said, you know, He's right. Why isn't this all just in the cloud? Why do I expect end users to have a powerful computer anymore? They should be able to just use a cell phone or a tablet or anything. And I wonder how hard that would be. Now, our college cannot get Amazon stuff right now because we just something about our DNS. See, we, we have strange internal political issues. I know nobody else has that. But, um, the, yeah. but anyway, for some reason, we're using both Microsoft email and Google mail as official email providers. And somehow the result is our MX records are trashed. And Amazon does not think we're a real EDU. They think we're some kind of fake imitation EDU. So you can't sign up for Amazon academic accounts right now. Although hope we're working with them to get that fixed. But anyway, that motivated me to look elsewhere. And what I did was I found Google Cloud Machines. Now, Google is not the leader in the cloud market. But for academics, they're my favorite because they give you $300 of free service with no nonsense with just a Gmail account. You do have to put in a credit card number, but they don't charge it. And I just discovered before this workshop, if you use up the 300, you can just go to another Gmail account and get another 300 bucks with the same credit card number. So that's bloody awesome. So students can totally get enough free time to do stuff. And then they don't have to run any virtualization software, which I hate making them do because it's a waste of everybody's time. So that's what I recommend doing here. Um, so I go to this thing and click this thing, binary exploits and assembly code. And what this is, like all my workshops have been lately, is structured like a capture the flag competition. Um, not that I expect people to be enormously competitive, but it's just the way my goal here is everybody should find something to do. Yeah. Security threat detected. You have to enter HTTPS. Oh yeah, you have to enter HTTPS in the URL. That's all that I've had that happen before. Yeah, okay, never HTTPS. Okay. Try that. That's good. Thank you. I've seen that happen before. I think Cisco networks often block my website if you don't put in the HTTPS. All right, good, good, good. And that, by the way, is exactly the right thing to do. I'm going to just get started here and then go through the room, make sure people are actually getting somewhere. There's nothing worse than a hands-on workshop that doesn't work. So, um, so go here. You click this link, um, binary exploits and assembly code. And here's what we're going to do. So let me just summarize it. Um, this is all Windows today. We're going to use one Windows cloud machine. And by the way, you could use your local Windows machine to do all this. You could use a local Windows virtual machine to do all this. But I recommend doing it in the cloud. If you aren't already used to the cloud, find out how great it is. You should, I think we should all just put all our stuff in the cloud. I'm very, um, it's so much better than even NetWare, for example. NetWare is very nice because students don't need to install anything locally. But you have to install a server and all this junk at the other end 
And if you just use the cloud, you don't have to do anything. And you can even run hacking tools in the cloud. I got real nervous because Amazon made a colleague cloud image and I went to workshop on it and they said, oh, you have to like tell us what you're going to do and get approval from us before you use it. And then people tell me, oh, you don't really have to do that. But anyway, then I couldn't get Amazon machines, but I found you can make a Google Debian machine and you can run a tool called Catulin, which puts all the Kali tools on that and it's fine. So you can totally use Kali in the cloud and use Windows in the cloud and they have that's pretty much everything I need. Anyway, so um, we're going to set up a machine. You get a, get a Windows machine of some sort. I used a Windows 2016 server, but it doesn't matter. And then we're just going to look at some code in the binary here. We're not going to do a whole lot of assembly code. We're going to do some uh, binary attacks. You can see how these programs look in memory and mess with them. Um, we're going to hack Minesweeper. Uh, this is from the Flareon CTF. Anybody do the Flareon CTF? Yeah, the Flareon CTF is a... Um, instant response challenge and they had a, a, a contest every year and I did it this year and I only made it like two or three levels but I already found something awesome. They totally taught you how to hack Minesweeper. It was all Minesweeper. And um, the first couple of levels were interesting stuff. I skipped it. The third one was wonderful and pointed me to a blog post it was based on where you totally hack Minesweeper and that is very useful. That's a fun activity. And then we're going to hack Putty and then um, look in detail at some of Windows protections. Um, Memory corruption exploits is what we're doing here. We're only going to end up with one exploit. We're not going to be developing a new exploit that's practical to take over a machine. We're going to be looking at the defenses and the structure of things in memory, hopefully so it's easier so you understand it better. And if anybody doesn't want to do all this complicated stuff, there's a simple obfuscation CTF to entertain you at the end. So let's, let me just say a few words about this cloud machine, which is, well, I think, wonderful. Um, so you just go with a Gmail account. You try it free. You sign up. You give it a credit card number, it really won't charge you, didn't charge me anything. And then it, you can create a machine. Um, you create a new machine and it will give you a Windows server. Now one annoyance is my college blocks RDP traffic, so you can't log into a Windows server or RDP and you'd have to go through a VPN or a tunnel or something, but Cisco didn't block it, which is nice. So we can use it right directly here. When you create an instance, this is very much like an Amazon cloud machine, of course. Amazon was first, and everybody else's cloud offering is their imitation of Amazon. Um, so you've got various uh, settings here. If you just take the defaults, which is what I used, it doesn't burn through your $300 too fast. Ran for a whole semester before I used up all my money with two or three of these going. And you can put in a variety of operating systems, anything you want. But I just chose a plain vanilla Windows Server 2016 for what we're doing today. But you can even put up your own ISO and put up anything you want. And then it will just deploy the thing and it will create a page with instances and you can download an RDP file, which just gives you the connection to connect over Microsoft Remote Desktop. And that's what I've got right here. I just installed a Windows Remote Desktop client and that is my Cloud Server 2016 machine. And all they do is install default Windows Server 2016 and they install this utility I've used before that you've probably seen it that gives you just facts about your machine and that's it. Now you can run software on it and it doesn't matter what you have locally. So um, that's the first activity. And let me talk a bit about the second one and then I'm gonna pause and go around and make sure everybody is making progress. We're gonna use a mute, we're gonna install several things on here, which is pretty awesome because we're not limited by the local bandwidth. You're installing to the cloud. So it's Google's bandwidth. So even if your local bandwidth was slow, which it probably isn't here, but it might be at your college or anywhere, it doesn't matter. Students can have a dial-up modem at home and it doesn't matter because you're installing onto a cloud machine. So downloads never come locally. Anyway, so you got to turn off Internet Explorer Enhanced Security and then you can use IE to download things. Um, and when you, you can install uh, Immunity. Immunity Debugger is the standard for Windows. People want to cheat on Windows games or the earlier Simulate product, Ollie Debug. And it's the one we're going to use here. Immunity is the one that's currently maintained. And when you install Immunity, it also puts on Python. It puts on a really old version of Python, but that's fine. It works. Um, Python never installs correctly on Windows. They can't fix the path. Most open source software cannot fix the path on Windows. I don't know why, but they never seem to learn how. So I recommend making a link, which is the Unix type solution. You can do it in Windows too, so you can run Python. And so on my cloud machine, I can open a command prompt. Click start and CMD and enter and yes. Okay, there we are. If I get a command prompt, I can type Python. And I have Python. 
Python 2.7.1, which like I say is really old, but who cares? For simple things, it's good enough, and we're only going to use very simple Python. Exit parentheses. All right. And so once you've got immunity in Python, there's a form you can fill in for both of the first two to, to get yourself on the scoreboard for having done these things. And the third thing, I think I'll show you a hacking Minesweeper, and then I'm just going to pause and go around the room, make sure everybody's making progress. So you download Minesweeper. This is the old Windows XP Minesweeper program, which there is a later version. You could probably hack that one too, but this is the one I happen to just follow a blog where someone showed you how to do this. And um, once you've got it, I made this thing called Mind Sham, which is my copy of it. Um, I modified it a little bit, so you'll get special messages, so you have something to, to turn in to prove that you successfully hacked this thing. And the point here is we're going to examine how this game works, and we're going to mess with it. So let me go to my downloads folder, to where you're going to get it. Okay, downloads, and in here is Mind Sam, and there's Mind Sam. All right, and I can zoom in for people in the room anyway. This is the old game of Minesweeper, so you click a button, and these colored numbers appear, which tell you how many mines are adjacent to that cell, and you can deduce by logic where the mines are, but what we're gonna do is cheat and look in memory and find out where the mines are. And not that it's you need it to break this game, which is really very easy to beat, but it is a useful exercise to learn how Windows handles memory and to learn some tools you can use to examine the memory and mess with the memory in Windows games which is how you cheat on games, and it's then how you make malware and how you analyze malware and how you develop exploits. So this is all just a way to get my students used to using um, these tools. Now, one funny thing about this Windows 64-bit system is Minesweeper works, runs at 32-bit, but you can't launch it from inside Immunity. I don't really know why, and that baffled me because other 32-bit pro other programs do launch correctly, but, you know, there's a workaround. This is mostly what hacking is. Um, in Immunity Debugger, I always run it as administrator, by the way, because you can run it without running as administrator, but if you do, you cannot change the font size and have it remember the font size. So um, all these tools are sort of strange and broken and irritating. So that's why I always run this as administrator. Then you can change the font size, which is very important for me, maybe not for you, because you might have good eyes, but I'm projecting up here and I want everybody to see it, and I don't have very good eyes, so I work hard to figure out how to make the font bigger and everything. So this is Immunity, and you normally can launch a program right inside Immunity to see how it runs, but in this case, Minesweeper will crash if I do that. For some reason, I haven't figured out. So what I do is attach to the running process, file attach. Now you can attach to a running process, which ought to be about the same thing as launching it, but it works. And launching it does not work. So here it is loading it. Now what it did was load all the pieces of Minesweeper. Um, Microsoft Windows programs have an EXE, and then they have DIL files. This is the genius and idiocy of the Microsoft operating system. Microsoft is a shameless commercial product, just like Facebook, right from the beginning, said the purpose of this thing is to make money. So they want you to be able to write software and sell it, and they want you to be able to resell it over and over again. So they use dynamic linking, which is unsanitary and dangerous, but it makes programs smaller and faster, and it makes it easier to make money. But it has this strange effect that you can write a program, say back in the days of MS-DOS, you could write something like a device driver, some kind of program, put it in a library, and it intended to be used on one machine, within one process. And then you can publish that code and reuse it as a service, which services other processes on the same machine, and then you can connect it through the component object model to the network, so people on the local network or even the internet are connecting to that process, which was designed by the programmer 20 years ago for a very different threat model. And this is why there's an endless series of Microsoft Windows vulnerabilities to the RPC channel, because those are connecting to processes which were typically developed for complete with, with no concept of ever being available on the network. But anyway, that's the Microsoft system. So you see right now, it has stopped at NTDIL debug breakpoint. The way immunity works is it connects to a process and then it patches the RAM. It takes the RAM that contains the instruction codes and it changes one byte to CC which is int3, which is the interrupt just for this purpose, the debug breakpoint. So this return statement here shows me return, which is what the operating system and the programmer put there, but what's really in memory at that point is a CC, and immunity has broken to come here. That's how it works. It lies to you about what's in memory, replaces one byte, and then it can break at any point. 
Now, the whole point of immunity is to make it possible to examine programs. So what it always does when you load it is it loads the program, gets it ready to go, and then does not run it. It puts a breakpoint right at the start. The problem is running 32-bit code on a 64-bit operating system requires two launch sequences. One, to launch the Windows on Windows, basically a virtual machine type environment, and the other to really launch the software. So right now, my program is not running. When you load a program, it's paused. And let me say something about this. If you haven't used a debugger before, or a disassembler, the first thing you do is give up and go do something else because it just presents you with too much baffling information all at once. And so ignore all this complicated stuff. The only thing that matters right now is this thing in the corner saying it's paused. Although I will, let me just say what you've got here. This is the assembly code that runs the program, which right now is extremely uninformative. It just looks like I've got a return and then a bunch of interrupts. Not clear what's going on there at all, but down here's stuff that makes a little bit of sense where it's gonna jump and call things. Over here are the registers, AX, EIP, the instruction pointer is usually the target when you're trying to hack into machines, which we're gonna do a little of at the very end, not much today. That. And here's um, the stack. This is the stack. The, the registers ESP and EBP point to the stack. You can see this is BOFF54, and that's what's here. Um, as we all know, it is, because of history, RAM is numbered in 8-bit bytes, but used in 32-bit or 64-bit words. So you have this madness that the stack pointer points to BOFF54, but what you actually have there is a series of 32-bit words, because this is 32-bit software. So this is the one, this one, and so the actual contents of it are here, 775C39B9, hexadecimal, and this is what it points to. This is a return, this is something, this is a pointer to a structured exception handler record, and so on. That's the structure of the stack, which we'll mess with at the very end here. And this is just a place where you can dump stuff out in hex and ask you like you might in Wireshark. Anything you want can be dumped here. So anyway, the point is when you launch a program, it's not running anymore. You have to hit the run button to make it run, or you can use the menu, debug run. And when you hit the run button, if I had a 32-bit operating system, it would be running now. On a 64-bit operating system, it will start running and then stop. I'm thread terminated, although it's not that obvious here. Uh, let's see if I can actually use Minesweeper. Maybe. Oh, in this case, it actually let me start. Okay, I haven't really got to the bottom of that. Anyway, so now it's running. I can play the game, and I can see what happens down here. So I want to view the memory that it's running. I'm not really going to mess with the code right away in this one. I'm just going to view the memory. You hit view memory, and it will show you the memory sections that are used by this program. Uh, for some reason, the stuff it puts at the top is not really the most interesting stuff. You have to scroll down a bit. And here's the actual sections of Minesweeper. The name is named Minesam. It's got a PE header. Microsoft Windows software is portable executables, which means it has a header that specifies what libraries to load and other information. And then you have various sections. You can have as many sections as you want, but you almost always have these sections. You have text, which uh, the fundamental rule of all Microsoft um, products is that everything is named the opposite of what it is. This helps you remember it very easily. So the text section does not contain any readable text. It contains unreadable instruction code. That's the actual commands. Um, the data is what contains the strings, and the resources contains things like icons and graphs and stuff. So um, the data section is where you would expect it to store information about the board, and that's in fact the case. So you can right-click that and dump. That will give you a dump of the data section, which is just hexadecimal stuff. On the left, you see 16 um, bytes at a time in hex, and on the right, you see it in ASCII. This is just pointers or something. It's unreadable. But if you scroll down a bit, you'll find some readable stuff here. For example, here's something, enterprisepack.ini. That's some kind of initialization file in, by the way, Unicode. Uh, the, Microsoft doesn't use strings hardly ever because Microsoft is an international operating system. So they use Unicode, 16 bits per character, so there's a null after this. And um, anyway, if you go down a bit, here you find something pretty interesting. This has a pattern, sort of looking like the game board, and it is very like the game board. That is the game board. It is that easy to find it. And let me um, bring up the game here. Yeah, I think this will do. Um, if I go into like the compatibility mode, I could expand that game, but I'm not going to mess with it right now because I haven't practiced that on this machine. I think I can do it by zooming in for the people in the room. Okay, so notice one, 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 two, blank, one, 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 and here I got AAA, ABAA, ABC. The A, B, and C are the one, two, and three. The at 
is the empty cells, the uh, other character like 40 or, or 0F I think is a cell that hasn't been clicked. That's the game board. It's that easy. So you can see where the mines are in that board. And all you have to do is um, develop a hacking tool to make it a little bit easier. You could, in fact, just see it right there in Immunity and see where the mines are. Um, but if you use process, proc dump, which is also included in Windows Task Explorer, uh, Task Manager, although you would have to use the 32-bit version of Task Manager, which is slightly irritating to find on a 64-bit machine, proc dump is probably better than the system journals tool. You can use proc dump to dump out the memory into a file. And then you can write a little Python script that will um, view that file. So if you use HXD, a simple hex editor, you can view the memory in a hex editor and search. And it turns out the start of the file has a bunch of 10s followed by a bunch of Fs. So if you search for four 10s followed by four Fs, you'll find the game board. And you can make a little Python script, which is really quite easy to read the dump file and hunt for that series of bytes, 10, 10, 10, 10, F, 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 and then print out the results. And I've got that in here. This is, um, what do I call this thing? Cheat.py. And so let me see if I can run that. I should be able to. If I go here and back to my command prompt. Okay, and I go to downloads and uh, probably proc dump and dir. Yeah, my cheat.py is here. So I can do Python cheat.py, and there you go. It, it does the dump of memory. It finishes it. Now it hunts through the dump to find the, the game board. And when it finds it, it draws it there. So here I have the game board. Uh, show, the stars show where the mines are, and the numbers are there. So by looking at that, it's very easy to win the game. When you win the game, you can put it in the, the uh, scoreboard. So give, give, the, give that stuff a try. Let me go around and make sure everyone's making some progress here. And you will appear on a scoreboard like a CTF, which is up here at the top. Uh, let's see how that's looking. Yeah, this guy did some stuff yesterday. I put this up a day or two ago, so some people saw it and started doing it already, which is fine. Um, but you'll appear here when you get some things done, so give it a shot. I'm gonna pause the recording and wander through the room and make sure um, people are making progress, because I will show you stuff, but it's a whole lot more fun if you actually do stuff. So let me uh, pause recording. All right. So, some people are on the board, uh, and the rest of them are in the process of getting your machine up. So let me talk about um, hacking putty. All right. So now let's mess with the code and actually modify the operation of the program, which is, in a very simple way, this is very basic stuff. So if anybody actually knows reverse engineering, you can leave. But anyway, the, uh, um, so you, I got, an, again, an older version of putty. Not for any particularly good reason, although it is kind of humorous. Let me point out some stuff about this. Anyway, so Putty is, of course, a uh, SSH client familiar to all of us uh, from the dim and distant years when Windows didn't include an SSH client, which I think is still the case of this server 2010. Although well, supposedly with Windows subsystem for, or Linux subsystem and everything, they're going to include SSH on Windows soon. But all, until recently, they didn't, and all the rest of us had used Putty. So you got Putty here. This is the same old thing, been around forever. So Putty lets you type in the name of a server, like mine80.samsclass.info, or any other SSH server. And when you connect, you have to spell it right. Maybe I spelled it wrong. samsclass.info. There we are. And then it invites you to log in with this login as message, and then you can log in and do SSH, which I don't care about. I'm going to hijack it and alter this message. That's all I want to do. Now, by the way, I should mention parenthetically, I was very surprised when this worked, because um, if you use a plain hex viewer, I don't know if any of you have been around for a really long time, there's a time when computer forensics, the only tool you could use was Norton Disk Editor. Um, and Debug. what's that? Debug. Debug, yeah. And so here's... HXD is just a modern version in the same genre. This is a raw hex editor. You can just view the contents of memory or files or anything in raw hex. So if you look at that program here with file open, and I go to my downloads, and I open putty, 
Okay, PuTTY has got sections here. Windows um, executables always start with MZ, and then they always have this message, this program cannot be run in DOS mode and so on. That's the portable executable format that Windows uses. But if you go all the way to the end of PuTTY, you will find some very strange stuff down here. And here it is. Um, this stuff looks like garbage, but it's not. It's semantic corporations, semantic time stamping services, and other names of companies here. This is a digital signature. This is signed code. Now, the whole point of code signing is you're not allowed to modify it. And this is a uh, Microsoft does a lot of strange things. Um, so if you go to the putty and you look at its property sheet, it's got a digital signatures tab. And you can go here and view the details. This guy, Shaman Tatum, is apparently the guy that wrote this thing. And if you go here, it'll tell you this digital signature is okay. And I say, well, that's great. But you know, if you actually modify this file, Let's make a copy of it. I'm gonna, um, I don't wanna lose my original in case I foul up, which I do a lot. Let's call this PuTTY 5, all right. So if I wanna modify PuTTY 5, I could just, um, yeah, I could just use the command line, let's do that. So if I do here and then go um, dir, I've got PuTTY 5 here, which has 368, and I should be able to do echo um, one, Greater than, greater than putty five. That ought to do it. Now if I do a dir, putty five is now 372. And before it was um, 368. So I just added four bytes of something to the end of putty. Now, so the putty should be broken. So uh, let's, what's that? Is it gonna stop working again? <laughs> well, you, it ought to stop working, right? I've modified the file. And the whole point of a signature is you can't modify the file. So if I run PuTTY 5, what does Microsoft say? It says, sure, fine, no problem. I can put in a thing. I can connect to a thing. It's working just fine. It doesn't care. No, it doesn't. Uh, that's right. Well, no, it's in the section at the end. That one is semantic. So it's in the signature. I just added some stuff to the signature. Is there an end-of-file marker after oh, the signature? Uh, there might be. Yes, and by the way, I went to a conference and they were talking about how to hack Windows signed binaries, and they said, in fact, they only sign about half the sections. You can modify the other sections, and they won't know this. And that is good, clean, fun. And that, by the way, is true of almost all Microsoft defenses. They really only usually apply to about half the software. But in this case, um, in this case, that's not true. In this case, Microsoft detected that I broke this file. If you go to properties of this file, and go to the, um, what is this nonsense? Uh, the digital signatures tab is gone. It is not signed software anymore. I broke the signature, what I just did. But it doesn't care. And when, if you do the project we're gonna do here, I'll make a clean copy so you can see. The, if you, you change it in a less brutal way, like not changing the total size of the file, the signature tab, which signature will remain valid, and it will tell you it's not signed, but it'll still run. And it won't even pop up a box and warn you or anything. So this is uh, one of the many times when Microsoft security measures are just sort of baffling. So let's make PuTTY 6. And let's hack PuTTY 6 in a more interesting way. So here's PuTTY 6. Now I'm going to put it in immunity. So let's see if I already have immunity running. I do. All right. So here's immunity running, uh, looking at Minesweeper. Well, I'm done with Minesweeper. So I'm going to open PuTTY 6 instead. And PuTTY lets you open it inside, um, inside immunity. It works better than Minesweeper. So I'm gonna open PuTTY 6, because I don't wanna break up my good copies. That's PuTTY 6? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, so here's PuTTY 6 loading. By the way, if you see a lot of windows and it's confusing, maximize the CPU window if you wanna get this back to its normal view. So this is PuTTY 6. It has now gone here, and it has paused. Because remember, this is what debuggers always do. They load the program and pause to show you what you got because presumably the reason you opened it in a debugger is you don't want to just run it normally. You want to look at what's in there and find out what's happening. So if I want to run the program, I run it here. And then it runs and pauses again. Because like I said, the first thing I think it has to do is load a 32-bit 
environment to run this on the 64-bit system because this does not happen on a 32-bit system. I really haven't looked in a lot of detail, but then it runs and pauses again. You got to run it again, and now it's running. And because it's running, it'll be open in another window down here. And um, let's see, not that, but someplace around here should be a putty window. There it is, and I can now connect. So what I would like to do is find the code that prints that message login as. So I right click here. Um, this is something kind of cruel about the debugger. These panes are actually quite separate. And when you take actions, it matters what pane you're in. So this, I want to look in um, the running code. That'll the most important when you're saving a file though. So here I'm going to search for all referenced text strings. Now this is actually pretty great. Um, yes, there we are. Okay, now if you use the strings utility, or the Windows utility bin text from McAfee, it goes through a file and finds all the strings. But all it does is look at the bytes, and when it finds a series of bytes that's four or five or longer, that is ASCII text, it prints it out. Now that's fine to look at something like a malware sample, but this is doing something much smarter. It's going through the code and finding references to strings here, things that are used, pushed on the stack or something, and showing you those. This is real strings that are actually used by the code as strings to print messages or something. So it's not wasting your time on everything. So here's all the strings in this file. Now the search engine is pretty primitive here. So you have to scroll to the top. And the one thing that really frustrated a lot of my students is if you don't run the program first and search, Right now, I'm searching in putty6.exe, text strings referenced in putty6. If you don't run the program first, you're looking for text strings in the NTDIL Microsoft software that is preparing this, the 32-bit environment, and you'll never find the strings we're looking for. That's one thing about debuggers. You have to be able to know whether you're looking at the code written by the developer of the software you want to hack into or the operating system. And usually, you're looking for mistakes to develop, maybe because they're a lot easier to find. Unless you're super elite, you're probably not finding bugs in Windows itself. Anyway, so now here I am. Now I can search for um, the string. And the string here is the text login as. I know it's going to print this message on the screen. So it probably stores that message as a string. It could store it other ways. But since I don't think putty is like malware and deliberately trying to hide from me, the programmer probably just did it the usual simple way. But it didn't find it on me. Let me see if I spelled it, it wrong. Give it, a uh, it shouldn't. Okay. Did I spell it wrong or something? Let's try long. Okay, oh, sensitive. Let's get rid of that. That can't be helping. Entire scope. That'll be fine. There we go. Okay, so now I find login as. I find one here, and I'm going to find another one. So since I happen to know I'm going to find two, I'm going to put breakpoints. You put a breakpoint in with F2. Function F2 on my Mac. If you press F2, this turns red, which means when it tries to use that string, it's going to stop and let me see what happened, because I want to find the code that uses that message. And I did that just to me more convenient, because now I know there's another one, and I'm going to put a breakpoint there, too. There are two strings named login as in this thing, and I don't know which one is used to print that message on the screen. So to find out, I put those breakpoints in it. And now there are various ways to proceed, but the way I want to proceed here is to save this file. Because one thing that took me actually a year or two to learn is how to save modifications in this program. Because it is far from obvious. You go back to the CPU window. Now, um, all I did was put, right now I can run it. We're not just saving it yet. So I launch, I run the program now. Um, I can do debug, restart. Reset and say yes, it clears the old one, start again. And there we are, it loads the program and it's paused like it always does. So I have to run it once and then it's gonna pause again and then I run it again. And now it comes up to here, which is good. So it's running now. I know it, has, it hasn't even tried to print out the login as message, so I have to give it the name of the server, which I put in here and then say open, and now I hit a breakpoint, breakpoint here. So that is the code that's about to print that login as message. So I found it by putting in those two breakpoints. And there it is, it's 41CB6E. And what this, this is the only assembly we're actually gonna do in this class. I hope you didn't hope, plan on learning a lot of assembly. This pushes something off of the stack. It pushes 
the address of this 467C7C, which is the pointer to the string login X. It's going to put it on the stack, then it's going to call some subroutine which will print it. That's all. Ultimately going to call a system routine to print it. Now we can, now, now I know how I want to hack this program. I want to modify that. So I'm done with my breakpoints. I'm going to get rid of them with view breakpoints. There they are. And I can just delete them. Right click and uh, remove. Right click and remove. Okay. Now I'm going to modify the code. I'm going to go back to the CPU window. With the normal home place and maximize it to get back to my familiar environment. Okay, right now it's printing login as, and by the way, if I would like to see the storage string, I can right click this and I can go to or follow, I think follow and dump should be in here. There, follow and dump immediate constant. This is extremely nice. I have a push command which pushes this address. If I follow the immediate constant, it will find the address and show what's pointed to down here. Because like I say, that's the whole point of a debugger. It is smart. It understands the code. So you're not down to a dumb product like strings that is just looking for things that are just sitting there. It actually understands that this is pushing an address. And here's the tag. Here you see login as colon, then a null pointer to terminate the string. Then it has other strings like SSH login name successfully started and so on. This is where the programmer put the string as they show the, the user under various conditions. So if I change this number right here, 467C7C, which is here, by the way, in little Indian order, which is another way to give everyone a headache. Uh, <laughs> the addresses are all backwards. So 00467C7C. So if I, I can change that. And you do it by, you can hit spacebar or you can right click assemble. You can modify code. Here's the current code, push 467C7C. So if I change that to 7C7D and assemble, then I'm done, so I'm gonna cancel. So now this blue thing tells me I changed that one byte to 7D. And 7C is the L, 7D is the O. So now it's going to print login hash, one character missing, the smallest possible change. Now I'm going to save my modified file. I go to the section I changed. This is the very irritating part that took me a year to figure out. If you, you can change the data section and you can change the code section, but you can't save both of them. You can only save one or the other. And it is very confused. So since I changed the code section, I didn't change this. I can say, you go to this section and save it from here. Right click. Um, copy to executable, I think. Uh, yeah, copy to executable. All modifications. That is a lie. <laughs> what it means is all modifications in that memory segment. And somehow they think that's obvious to you, which it was not to me. Now I do copy all, which you could argue this is not a lie. This is the complete executable, this whole thing. It's not just starting in that instruction. So now I right click in this thing and save file, and now it's gonna ask me to save it someplace and give me a chance to name it. I'm gonna call this putty seven. All right, and now I should have an interesting putty program to play with. I'm going to, uh, I think I'll just close immunity for now. And let's go take a look at it here. If I go here, I now have a thing called putty seven. Now, um, let's, use the command prompt is probably fine for this. Okay, so if I do a dir here, okay, putty seven is 368, um, 368, 368, three, this putty five was the one where I added some characters to the end. This one, I haven't changed the length of it at all. I've changed one byte from 7C to 7D in the code. Now that is exactly what signatures are supposed to prevent. Modified code where someone has changed the instruction. So let's see what the Microsoft's operating system has to say about this. In the first place, if I run it, it just launches fine, no complaint at all. And it runs, and then it prints the modified message, RDNS. So that I modified the code and it runs, which I was pretty offended by. I mean, what is the point of signed code? I'm not supposed to be able to do exactly this. Well, here's what the point of signed code is in the we're a strange world of Microsoft. There's a digital signatures tag. And if you click it, it doesn't say anything, but if you click this, and then you click last, it says, 
Oh, the signature's broken. Well, gee, thanks a lot. You could have told me that before I ran it, for example. That would have been swell, but no. Anyway, so I don't, that's what it does. Now, there are other, now, I think there are some versions of Windows and some versions of software which the signature actually does a little more, but, but I was, that's uh, someone at Microsoft will have to explain to me what they're thinking about this. Anyway, so now I can modify the code and save it. And I have another project I didn't put in this workshop where you actually put some malware in there and take over the machine and all that. Yeah. Are you this part of the session? Yeah. Yeah. It's all there. Yeah. And all these will stay up forever, by the way. And you can use them in your classes. All my stuff is open source. Everybody can put it in your class, print it in a book, put your name on it, sell it, keep the money. You know, um, you can, you can use this. That's the point. You can put this in your class. I'm even leaving the CTF running so you can have your students do it and go on the scoreboard and stuff if you want to do that. Although for these longer ones, you might want to build it into your class in more detail. Anyway. That's the point. You can now uh, hack a file with putty. And uh, all right. And um, then I got a couple things about um, assembly code. You'll see if I'm late. I have until 1230. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, that's right. Well, let me see how the scoreboard's doing. Maybe I should pause and let people work a bit. Um, we got a couple more things to show you, but let's see. Oh, oh, there we go. Lots of people have got their machine up. Like I say, just getting that machine might be the only thing you take from this workshop, which is fine. The customer is always right. When I go to these things, I'm just hoping to find one or two things to throw in my class. That's my idea of success. Um, but anyway, the point is, window, hacking Windows games is a really good way to get students started to see how the machine uses memory and get used to messing with it. Uh, the Linux binary exploits are the next step after that. But I've switched to my malware analysis class and my exploit development class. I started this way to try to make it stay on relatively familiar territory. Um, all right. Well, since so many people moved ahead, I think I'm just going to go ahead and demonstrate the next bit here because I think uh, it's good to have a bit of discussion about it. Um, <laughs> All right, so here, the next bit I wanted to show you is more details about Microsoft defenses, which I found very interesting. I, I've been taught, I think, uh, malware analysis several times, and this time I finally got much more deeply into the Microsoft defenses, which are really very interesting. Because, of course, I've been using Windows Server 2008 as a target. Years ago, I used to use XP and Windows 2000, then upgraded to Server 2008, and 2008 is getting really old, so I'm updating all my stuff to Server 2016, and I expected great suffering, because Microsoft has added all these new defenses, and not so much, uh, which is what you always find. Microsoft always advertises these defenses, and when you really look at it, they really haven't done as much as you think they have at all. Um, so um, you can put, I was very, very pleased finally to find that you can put Visual C++ build tools on Windows Server 2016 quite easily. You can compile things the way the real pros write Windows software quite easily in a nice command line environment. I was using third-party compilers and everything else but this is very easy to put on simple build tools, and then you have effectively GCC, the full Microsoft version of it called CL, their C compiler, which is easy to use for simple demonstration programs and doesn't take forever to put on. I think it took me maybe five or 10 minutes at the most. Very nice. So once you have done that, you can now make programs on the machine. And what I did was I put up a program. This is one I gave my students in my exploit development class very early. This is a program just to be a very simple case of a buffer overflow. So what it does, it has a main routine. By the way, this is something I learned from Georgia Weedman's book, which changed my life. I kept making buffer overflows in main. If you do that, you can't exploit them because the memory handling between the operating system and main is strange. You have to make your overflow in a subroutine and then all the tutorials will work. Well, you know, I read all these books about buffer overflows and they never worked and I just felt stupid for a couple of years. There's always a few little gotchas. Anyway, so here's the main program. The main program um, just calls this thing called test PW and says you fail or win. The test PW has a buffer overflow. It's going to let you put in a password, CN into PIN, and then it's not going to check the length. So you can put in anything you want, including something that's longer than 10 characters. And then it's going to do just some math to see if you got the PIN right. And this math is not anything intelligent. It's just to make it so I don't just have if PIN equals 1 to make it not completely blindingly obvious what the right answer is. And by the way, one of my students did solve this by figuring out the right number, which is 48 or something, I don't know. But anyway, I just, um, I, but the point is, 
you're going to cheat to get in. You're not going to get in by figuring out the right number. What you're going to do is make an overflow by putting in more than 10 characters and get the UN message without actually knowing the right password. That's the point here. And the vulnerability is there. So um, you can make this thing run on Microsoft Windows here. I just put it in Notepad and save it. And here's how you compile it. Compile it a couple switches used for normal compilation, EHSC, and then it compiles it. And so here's the normal password, the CPP, and here's the uh, program with no stack protection. GS minus turns off the Microsoft GS stack protector, which is the enhancement. It's been around since I think server 2003. Microsoft stack protectors, which are really quite good. And you can turn them off, and of course, if you do, you're more vulnerable. So the point here is, um, all right, we can look at that thing in IDA. So let's take a look at it. Um, those programs should be here. Uh, I think I put them in C, let's go here, CD 127, just the number of my cores is what it was. All right, and if I do dir, okay, I've got pwd.exe and I've got pwdn.exe. So if I run those things, I think I can make that font bigger. Let me give it a try. Properties, there's font. Pick a bigger number and see what happens. Okay, well, it might be a little better. Anyway, if I do PWD, it asks me for the password and one is wrong, so I get fail. And if I run PWDN, it runs exactly the same way. The only difference is PWD is 216,064 bytes and PWDN is 215,040 bytes. It's smaller because it doesn't have the Microsoft stack defenses. It's the way it would have been compiled in earlier versions of Windows, like Windows 2000. And you can see the difference if you use IDA. IDA has two free versions, which are very nice. It has a pay version, which costs like 5,000 bucks. I only had one student motivated enough to shell that out. But the rest of us can use the free one. And again, it installs quite quickly on a cloud machine. So if I load PWD, and by the way, this is an important fact about disassemblers. A uh, disassembler is trying to let you see the assembly code that the compiler generated, and it is guessing. I thought this was a simple, logical process, and it is not. You can write code that disassemblers cannot understand. Um, it assumes, for example, that if you have an instruction that's two bytes long, an instruction that's three bytes long, the end of this instruction is followed by the start of the next one. You can make code that doesn't have that happen, and the disassembler will get it all wrong. So it has to guess some information about what guesses you'd like to make. I'm totally for the default guesses and then say, okay, and here's another thing that broke my heart. It's not ready yet. It's still not ready. This colored bar up here is still moving. It's disassembling. It is guessing and reconstructing the code. And it's not done until this bar stops changing. That baffled me for another half a year. I'd load it and things weren't there. Anyway, so when you're done, you see the code here. And here's another great, delightful thing. This is not the interesting code. This is the Windows operating system launcher. You gotta find the interesting code, which is very hard to find. So there is probably some brilliant solution for this, but I couldn't figure it out, so I have a simple workaround, which is this. You go, uh, Ida Pro, even more than a disassembler, even more than the debugger, a disassembler presents you with far too much information. But there's some places you can go to see nice familiar stuff, like view, um, or window, pardon me, windows, strings. Here's strings, why do I not see strings? Fine, let's see. Um, view. Right, maybe they're here. Imports, exports. Um, all right, I'm gonna check my instructions. I'm already lost. Ida is very easy to get lost in. Um, view, open subviews, strings. Okay, fine. View, open subviews, strings. Okay, fine. There. Now, these are the strings that are referenced in the program. And notice here, enter password fail you win. That's the code I want to look at. That's the code the developer wrote, not pieces of the Windows operating system, which I don't want to debug. So if you double click one of these, like enter password, it now shows you the data structures where that is stored. We are here in the R data section. Remember, we looked at the sections before. There's a text section which contains the executable code, and then there's things like data and R data. So the R data section is where it stores this string, enter password, followed by null terminator. 
So I have found where the password is stored, which is not really what I wanted. What I want to do is find the code that uses it, and that's over here in the data X ref. So you find the string that's interesting, you go to the data X ref, and you double click there, and now you actually find the code the developer wrote. This is what I'm going for. So it puts it in these boxes to try to make it easier to read, and the only thing I want to point out here is, it's going to start, this by the way is a function prologue, you get used to this, every time you enter a function, it has to create a new stacked frame. That's allocating space on the stack, that's what this is doing. And then it puts a security cookie. That is the Microsoft Stack Buffer Overflow Defense. When you enter a function, it puts a randomly generated value at the start of the stack. If you overflow the stack, it will change that value. And so at the start of a routine, it puts a security cookie. That's what Microsoft calls it. Um, Linux calls it a stack protector. And then when you leave someplace at the end, it's going to check that security cookie in order to, before coming back. I'm not sure we can see that here. It does. Here it is, checking the security cookie. So if you have a buffer overflow and you overwrite memory and exceed your allocated bounds of memory, it will detect that and it will not continue to run the program. It will stop and say, program crash, the operating system has saved you with this security cookie. That's the Microsoft Stack Defenses. And if you look at the one we compiled without them, PWDN, you'll see, of course, that they are not there. Now, this is another fun fact. If you use IDA to analyze things like real malware, you can spend a week or two weeks analyzing one sample, and you end up putting comments and notes and marks in the file. So it assumes you probably want to save the database, which is with all your changes. If you're an amateur like me, you just use don't save, because I'm not really doing anything advanced. But that by default, it assumes you, of course, want to save your place. I don't. So I'm not going to save a database. I'm going to let it use the same default guesses to try to figure out what the next program does. It's going to go through the same process, taking some time and dumping me in a stupid place, which is not where I want to be. And I have to again go to the strings, view, open subviews, strings, and find the strings like enter password that makes sense to me. Double click that, and then double click the X reference to it. And now I finally get to the code that lets you enter the password and decides if you win or lose. And notice it no longer makes a that cook, security cookie. It doesn't put in a cookie and doesn't check a cookie at the end. So this program is going to be vulnerable to a simple buffer overflow, which the other one is not vulnerable to. That's one bit of a, a useful thing to see, understand how this works. And in the last one of the ones I wrote up for this workshop, we do the overflow in the debugger and then in Python. So um, here's this ESP program. Uh, here's the first thing. There's another defense worth looking at, which is address space layout randomization, which also is a whole lot less effective than you might think. So I spent a while trying to figure out how to observe a register in C++, and it turned out to be incredibly simple. You just do it in assembly. You move the ESP. The ESP is not easily available, but you can move it into a data section, define an integer variable, put it in there, and then you can print the data section. So uh, that's how I managed to do it, by mixing assembler into my C. So I can now observe that program. And you can compile it with and without the overflow defenses. So this, this um, with and without randomization. This is the default compilation, which in modern versions of Windows turns on all the defenses, as it should. So ESP.cpp, if you run it, will show that the stack changes every time you run it. Because, of course, it's randomly moving it. By the way, it's not randomly moving it as much as it should. Uh, it's in fact doing a lot of things. By the way, I should mention in passing the security cookie I just showed you does not appear on every routine. Microsoft guesses whether that routine looks dangerous. If you don't have a string variable in it, if you don't have a read, in it, it guesses to see if it looks like you might have an overflow and only turns that on when it looks like you're going to have an overflow. You could fool it that way. But anyway, this randomization happens for what it's worth. It turns out the randomization is a lot less random than you think. But anyway, um, then you can, here's how you compile it without randomization. You do the compiling, compiling only without linking, and you do the linking separately with link, and then you use this switch telling it, don't use dynamic base addresses when linking. That's how you do it. Then you'll get a version of the code which runs, and it always has the same location of the stack pointer uh, in that program. So that means it's not randomizing things, and this, of course, is the way everything was until ASLR came out, which was Vista, when Microsoft added that, and much, much later when the Mac added it. And um, <laughs> legacy software often has to run in this mode. So now, 
you can make this password program again and um, compile it without ASLR because the simplest buffer overflow exploit needs to not have address space layout randomization included. And that's what we're going to do here. So this one, I think I'll just uh, catch cup up with this one live. This is PWD3 that I made this way. And I also added that it will print out the ESP. So let's take a look and see how that looks on my cloud machine. Um, if I go here and do a dir, I have PW3 3 here. What's happening? Okay. Anyway, so PW3 shows me the stack pointer 19FF18. If I give it a password of one, it's fail. And if I run it again, it's still the same. So this is running in the old mode with no defenses. Um, no address space layout randomization. So now we can perform a buffer overflow in the debugger, which I thought was a good thing for students to do to understand how it works. So again, I'm going to not save the old database because I really don't care. I want to open a new program, and that'll be PW3, PWD3. Again, I'll settle for the default analysis. Again, it's going to take some time to do it. And when it's all done, it's going to dump me in the wrong part of the program, which is just some kind of Windows launcher. And so I have to do the same old thing, search, uh, view, open subviews, strings. Then I find up here things like enter password and fail. That's what I want. And so I go to the cross-reference. Okay, and here's the code that does that. And let me... Um, all right, we've already looked at this one. Now what I want to do, though, uh, I got off on the wrong track there. I want to look at it in a debugger. So we've used IDA to just look at the code. And you can actually, I think, do some debugging in IDA, but it's not the best tool for the job. So let me go to my debugger. And then that is immunity here, which I'm running as administrator. Okay. Okay. And I'm going to load. PWD3, which is here. Okay. And there it is. It has paused here. I'm going to run it. And it's paused again because all that did was load the 32 bit environment or something like that. I'm not entirely sure what it does. I just know on 64 bit OSs you have to run it twice. Now I run it again. Now it's going to open a terminal here and say enter password. Now I could enter a password and then it's going to say fail. Now suppose I, so if I entered a normal password here, like A, I guess I might have to shrink it down for it to listen to my keyboard. Oh, it's paused down here. Okay, that's rude. Probably because it remembered some breakpoints. Oh, okay, I must have accidentally saved them before when I practiced this before the workshop. So let me clear the breakpoints. We'll put them back in in a minute. But for right now, I want to get rid of them. So I'm going to view breakpoints and delete them. Remove, remove. OK. And then like you always do, the cure whenever you get lost in the debugger, which happens a lot, is debug restart. Yes, this will get you back to the normal starting condition where it launches and pauses. Then you run and you run again. And now it should be running. It shows me running in the corner, which is what I want. And now I should be able to use it here and enter a password. So I get a password of A. It then says fail, and I'm done. So that's not very exciting. But what's more exciting is to run the overflow. So let's do debug restart again. And run and run. And now put in a longer password. One, two, three, four. There, so I put in uh, 32 characters. It is something that only has room for 10. Now when I press enter, I should get a more interesting result, which is down here, access violation when executing 48, 48, 48, 48. Now this is what you want. This is the classic buffer overflow. I have over, I exceeded the allowed memory. I've run through the local variable that had room for 10 characters and run through everything else that was in the stack frame until I actually hit the stored instruction pointer. And when it tried to return, 
it actually loaded that into the EIP. This is the simplest, most exploitable kind of buffer overflow. 48, 48, 48, 48, A is one, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Those are the four H's at the end of my password. Those four characters went right in the instruction format. And that means I control the EIP, which means it's easy to take over control of the machine. Now, they did a simple one. I just want to print the U win message, which is a lot easier than injecting new code. Um, and so in order to do that, I would like to examine the stack before and after the overflow. So I'm going to do debug restart again and say yes. And then um, run it and run it again because another thing very convenient about this program is it pauses for user input at a very nice point. So where it is right now is where I want to put the, um, the breakpoints. And uh, let me check my instructions and make sure I'm on track here. Um, so you find the overflow. And the code starts. All right. What I did was I just hunted for it through the code here because unfortunately the debugger does not show it live while you're running. So um, I found enter password. And then I went down and found the push instruction. And the call prints it, and the next call takes the input. So let's just do that. This is a very simple technique. Let's just get rid of this. I just don't know how good here. All right, here is the code. Windows code always thinks it's at 400,000. That is its virtual address. These are not necessarily real addresses, but all Windows software thinks it's running at, at the location 400,000. And so 400,000, 1,000 is where the text segment starts. And this is what contains the instructions. So if you do, the debugger makes this very easy. It shows you the address, the raw hexadecimal instructions. Here it shows you the assembly code with color coding. And but the fundamental rule, I've always tell students when confronted with this thing, and of course it's baffling and you don't know a lot, look for something you can read. Usually looking right and down is where they put the readable stuff. They hide it. So down here is something you can read, and over here is something you can read. So look for whatever you can read and just go with it. Like, a, think of a little kid who can't read, they can just see the pictures, and they flip through a book. It's, it is acceptable to be at that level when you're a beginner. So, um, I, I see something called password three over there. That's not too exciting, but if I scroll down a bit, I'll start seeing stuff I can read over there. Like, there's 4P8, and that's, keep going. There's another 4P8, I don't really know what that is. But eventually, I'll see something I can understand, and it doesn't have to take too long for such a simple program. Um, there, enter password. Now we're talking. So this is the code that pushes the address to that string on the stack. So it pushes up the string, enter password, it pushes up something else, I don't know what this is, maybe the format string or something, and then it calls some function. I can guess that's the function that prints to the user, enter password. Then, a couple lines further down, it pushes some other stuff on the string. It calculates, this is an address on the stack. That is the location of a local variable. Local variables are stored on the stack, and you get them by going at EBP minus something, or ESP relative something. This is a location in the stack string. This is a local variable pushed on the stack, and then it calls this. This is what reads the data into the local variable. This is what causes the buffer overflow. So before this is called, the memory is okay, and after this is called, the memory is corrupt. So I want to put the breakpoints here. And so I put them here at the call and at the instruction after the call. So that is here. Where's my call? Here's my call, there. So F2 to put a breakpoint there, and down one, and F2 to put a breakpoint there. There, if I've done it right, I can examine the memory before and after the buffer overflow. So let's do debug, restart. Yes. And then run. It should show me paused, which is normal. I run it and I run it again. Hmm. Not good. Now I hit the breakpoint. This is what I expected. Um, it is ready to take input from me. So let's take a look and see what we're seeing here. Yep, it's ready for me to enter the password. Now, the reason I put a breakpoint here is because now I can see the stack. And what we're inside this subroutine, and notice here is this pointer to some string that it's using as part of the printing or, or receiving process. There's some other data, I don't know what it is. Here's the return to the main function. This is the return address right here, 19FF1C, 
That's the value. Remember, all Microsoft programs work at 40, 400,000. This is the point of added computable code. In fact, it's 10 to F. It's just a little bit above here. I could scroll up there. We've already been past it today. So this is going to jump back to main. So what I want to do is overflow the stack down and change this value, this return point. So let me do that. If I continue here, um, I think I have to continue before I type in the data. Let me take a look. Okay, finding you, restart the program, um, debug run. Yeah, okay, so let me continue to the second breakpoint, and now it should be ready for me to type in the data, which is here. So it's, um, whoa, all right, there. B, 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 C, 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 D, 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 D. Whoops, I got extra junk in my character typing. All right, I'm gonna try and zoom in, there we are. B, C, 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 C. All right, and now after that, you see right here what damage I've done to the stack. Now, um, this is all the, the stack is now, instead of containing other structures like it used to, it contains all these characters and it turns out this is the address that used to be the return value. Now it's got the HHH in it. And if I run again, then of course it's gonna crash and, um, tell me that it hit that value. I think something might have gone wrong with my live demonstration, but I don't think so, because there it is, 48, 48, 48, 48. It loaded that, and then it will crash, of course. Um, all right, so that's, you can now make a working buffer overflow exploit in the debugger. This is pretty simple. Um, if you debug restart, and say, uh, by the way, before I do this, let me just show you the end result. Oh, that one crashed, right? Right, didn't ever came back with any answer at all. Didn't even say you failed, because I killed the program. So if I do debug restart again, and run, and run again to get to the breakpoint, and run to get past the first breakpoint, now I can modify this address. So let's figure out how to win. The way to win is to find the part of the code that prints the win message. And we did that, we can do that by just scrolling through these simple programs. So we were here, we found uh, enter password someplace down here. There's enter password, Some, there's fail, and there's you win. So here's the code that prints you win. It is, whenever you call something in assembly language, you don't just go to the call, you have to go to the push push call, because the push is what puts the arguments there, the call is what prints it. If I jump straight to the call, it will print something that will not have the message in it. So the place I need to go is here, 401, 270. And you can just put it here in the stack. Um, you can go down to this return value and modify it. Right click, modify, and you can put in that address. So I wanna get it all blown up on my screen big enough to see. It's 401, 270. Um, and I think I did it differently before, so let me make sure I'm on my right track here. Um, yeah, I did it with edit stack there. Looked a little different when I did it before, but anyway, I'm just gonna try it here. Let's see if this works. It looks like, okay, 0401, 1270, okay. Okay, this is pretty nice. The, uh, when I did it before, I had to reverse the order of the bytes manually. Here, it looks like it did it for me. Let's just say, okay, it looks pretty good. It looks like it's modified that value. If this is true, if I run, I should win. So I run, and let's see what happened. Uh, I have to put in something, and now I have to run. And... Fail, okay. I think I had to do it after the first breakpoint. I think when it went to the next breakpoint, my, my value went away. Uh, so let me just try it again, because we're not out of time, and I'm getting there. And the point is this, well, it's a little bit awkward. I think it makes it easy for students to see what you've got. So here we are. I wanna go past the first breakpoint, and now I wanna change this return value Get it? Ah, okay, now I guess I get the expected message. Okay, and so it's backwards, 70, 12, 40, 00. 
is the address you have to put in. 7012 here. So 7012. Okay. Then I say okay. And that changes to pointing to a value in the PW3 routine. Now, if I go here and put in the wrong password of A and press enter, it hits the next breakpoint. And if I continue, Still gave me fail. All right, I don't know what I did wrong. I'm not going to struggle with it. It's right in the instructions. I probably put in the address of the fail instead of the address of the win. But it is possible to get the you win here at this point. And um, you can make a Python code that will do this. Now, remember before, the real way you do this, of course, you can't run a real trigger you're targeting in the debugger. What you do is you put it in the password. The four H's at the end end up in the EIP. So the way to put do this with Python, or you can do it with Perl or any other language, is just use a code that can print non-printable characters. So I print A, A, B, C, D, D, E, F, and then instead of the H's, I put in those bytes, 70, 12, 40, 0, 0. Um, that, those are not printable characters, but not necessarily, but um, now I can do it. So I mean, that, this is the Python programming part of this class, which is also pretty limited. And so if I do this, um, I should have my Python attack code. Um, oh, I put it, let's see, exploit one.py. Well, I'll just put it in here. Copy and paste, by the way, works with these cloud machines, which is very nice. So I can do notepad exploit.py, say yes, and then paste. And there's my attack code, which is just one line, and save that with file save. And now I can run that, if, if I run that code, it prints out that junk, which is those characters and then some non-printable characters at the end. And if I wanna see it take over the machine, I have to pipe it into, say, pw3.exe. And now I win. It asks for the password, it gets it from the code, and I win. So um, that's the goal here. And we're at 11.53 is what I thought. We're down to the last half hour. Let me take a look at the scoreboard. And uh, see, yeah, good, we got a lot of people making some progress here. I just thought if you've had enough of this binary, which I don't know how many of you have, there is another thing that might be fun, which uh, my students got a kick out of. Um, I'm trying to move into talking to management. I gave a talk to a, uh, we started a security club at my college. A new guy came on our staff and he's very good. He used to be a corporate manager. And so he's bringing competent management to the college, which we sadly need. And he is, um, so he's trying to uh, reach out to the business department. He started a club and all these business students are coming in and they're not very technical. And my message to them is you don't need to be technical. In fact, I wish you would not try. I used to be uh, basically a paralegal. I worked for uh, the Federal Trade Commission under contract to analyze data. And lawyers thought they knew computers. And I wish they would just not pretend to know and do everything wrong, but just let us do it for them because we know what we're doing. And it's the same thing with managers. I mean, why would your manager pretend to know stuff like Dilbert's boss and come in with some stupid idea they read about the blockchain and try to get you to do it when, when it would be better if they'd actually know what their job is. And there's two problems. The first thing is they often don't know enough technical stuff to do technical right. And the second thing is someone has to do the management right. I'm watching all these data breaches and I, I'm trying to, so I'm, my message to these business types, and I'm going to teach a class just to, in this stuff, um, how to make decisions for security responsibility is the name of the class. It's based on a class at Tufts, which was cybersecurity for future presidents, which I thought is a very good idea. Decision makers need to understand the security consequences of what they do. And it is not about analyzing the binary code. It's about thinking about what you're doing here. And you should be asking hard questions, which are not technical, like what data did you collect? Where did you put it? How did you protect it? Don't give me a bunch of complicated crap. Give me simple answers to these questions. You should be able to tell me what you collected. And we should be able to say, why don't you just not collect it? Or why don't you put it in something that's not connected to the internet at all or something like that? These would be really helpful if management would focus on that level, which is not being done. The technical people will just write some complicated app and expose it all to the internet and not realize anything's wrong. They really need management to do that. That is their job. It's like the captain of the ship has to really be driving the ship. They can't be down in the engine room with a wrench. They have to really be driving the ship. 
because the engineer will not pay attention to that. Anyway, so um, I made this CTF for them, and I just, well, it just is obfuscation stuff. This is low-grade cryptography. So you try this one if you like. Um, this is beginning people think about crypto. This is the old-fashioned crypto. What is, what is CTF? What's that? What is CTF? A CTF is capture the flag. That's how, that's how almost everybody in security does training these days. It's just because people like games and competition. So anyway, there's various things here, reverse things, um, real ciphers. And one thing which I thought was kind of handy, and you might check this out, I'm teaching a cryptography class again next semester, and I really want to reach people who are not very technical, not very mathematical. Um, and I, I had them installing Python and using Python because Python is super easy, and now I don't even have to have them install Python. This is more cloud stuff. I found this thing which is the greatest thing since sliced bread. This thing, Remix. You can just have a page with Python. It runs and you can edit it right there and it's free. And you can save a link that will explode your code. So here's my code. You have to modify this code to get the answer. That your homework is right there. You just do it right there. You don't install anything. You could be doing it on a cell phone. This is my latest thrill is to stop trying to support students that can't get the VM running and can't get the network running and can't get the keyboard running in the video driver. Remix to just Python? Yeah, it's like all kinds of languages. Yes. There's another thing I thought, I wanted to make sure you guys would see this. That is some kind of login. Now let me find their page that shows what they got. Remix. Bplat, that's not it. Let me try Remix Python and see if I can find it. Um, New Python Trinket Remix. There we are. Put interactive Python anywhere on the web. Yeah, but how do I get there? Uh, maybe this? You know, they should put it powered by Trinket. There, it's Trinket. It's not Remix. Trinket is the name of this thing. Let's see if I can find a link that works somewhere. Um, they don't advertise themselves very effectively, do they? It should have a link somewhere I can click to see it. All right, let's try the searching for Trinket. Yeah, the, I don't need that. I didn't log in, I don't think. I mean, here, there it is, Trinket. Share code from any device. There you go. And um, you got Python. Well, I'm not quite sure. These are tutorials for interactive resources. Maybe it's only Python. I'm not, yeah. Ripple? How do you spell it? R E P L dot I T. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. Can you make those little things where you you know pop up? Yeah, that I, I think that's awesome. So I'm going to be using that extension the next semester to hopefully be even less irritating because I want them to focus on how to do the encryption, not how to install the software on the device. And uh, you know, that's why the future is all containers. You know, containers solve another problem. Um, containers are the new improvement on virtual machines, much smaller, much faster, because it turns out everybody is driven nuts by the same problem. You install software, but you don't have the right library version, you don't have the right compiler version, you don't have all this junk. And so why don't you just give me the whole thing in one package? Whatever version you need of Python and libraries and everything, that's what containers are, which is the way it ought to be. Um, every, and everything in one virtual machine-like thing that is not very big, that has the right version of everything, so I can use whatever you've done instead of struggling with it. And of course, the thing that got my attention, I've been working on this for the last several weeks, is um, container orchestration through Kubernetes. Because the way everyone really does it these days, everything is in the cloud, and everything is a container, and everything is deployed in multiple copies. So if you have more load, more customers come in, you just deploy more copies of the container, and that's done automatically. And the orchestration platform used is Kubernetes. And it's actually not that hard to set up, but, the reason, of course, that I care is because Kubernetes just had a god-awful security flaw last month. We can totally take over everything, escape the containers, take over the host machine. I said, i got to get that working. So I've been setting up Kubernetes for the last couple weeks, and it's helping me set up another thing I think I'll show you, which is red versus blue. This is what I'm planning to take around to DEF CON and everything this summer. Um, I've been doing CCDC. How many of you are doing CCDC? Yeah, sorry, Cyber Patriot, how many of you are doing that? Yeah, uh, Cyber Patriot is very nice, um, and CCDC is very nice. But CCDC is very frustrating for community college teachers. I think you probably noticed it's, it's really designed for four-year colleges. And they have a lot of rules, in particular a full-time rule, that fee, 
it's very frustrating to actually make a team that can get anywhere. The other thing, there's three things about CCDG that drive me nuts. The fact that you have to be full-time, um, the fact you have to pay a fee, and the fact that they lie to you about the scores. Now, that is really rude. Well, there's another related thing, which is they don't tell you how to prepare. Like you say, well, is there a textbook I can go through to prepare my students? No. Is there like an outline? No. And they say, well, I'll give you a talk. People give me a talk, and they say they have to know everything about everything. And I say, well, that's not really helping. Um, so it's, it occurred to me, I want to make my own product, my own contest that is simpler. And I'm planning to, I've already done beta tests with my own students. So I'm going to be inviting community colleges to join us next semester. We'll make a simpler, smaller contest that is more like a homework assignment that doesn't have any of those rules and that is contained. So we can tell you what's going to be in it and then you do that. And I got the first three or four of them going. So let me show you that because that's another thing that uh, you might be interested in. Here's our class to prepare for cyber competitions. And we now have a new teacher, Elizabeth Biddle, calling this teaching this, and I'm just the assistant, which is a whole lot better. And so here, I made these red versus blue. This is based on a red versus blue contest I did at CactusCon, which some company put out, and it was very nice. And so what I did, was, let's make it very, this is like CCDC, but much simpler. And I think probably the best one is the last one here. This is where I took a Windows domain controller, and I put some vulnerable software on it, and some, uh, and then all you do is download this thing and run it in VirtualBox. You can have a virtual appliance that has many machines as you want, but so far I'm only doing one machine. And then the students break up into teams, two defenders and two attackers. Just two against two, and there's multiple copies of two against two in the room. And they run, and there's a live scoreboard running, and the scoreboard is not a lie. All the points are on there. And all you have is the red team, the... Um, the blue team has to keep the machine up, and the scoreboard will check every 10 seconds to see if your web server's up, and if the server's up, and a few other things, and give you points for that. And I made some injects where you have to do some administrative tasks, and the red team has to hack in and leave hints as to how they got in. And these files then give the red team points, and the blue team can read these to find out how they got in. And uh, you run this, it doesn't take any fancy resources, it covers only one small group of topics that you can reasonably prepare students for. It only goes for an hour or two. And this, I think, is much better. And I'm getting there. And in this one here, they even had Splunk installed on the machine. And that's where I'm going. I'm going to have Splunk. And because uh, the one I did at CactusCon, the blue team did not block the attacks. They just had to find the attacks in Splunk. So my plan is, when I get my containers up, maybe I'll do it another way before I get there, is to have three or four vulnerable machines in this. And they're going to have to choose one to be the honeypot. And the point is you detect the others and you deliberately don't protect that one and detect the attacks coming into it. And that's all possible as Splunk. So I thought I'd mention that. And if I, yeah, it's on 140, but I mean, yeah, 140 in my old classes. But these are the early versions. I'm going to have better versions of it next semester. These are the first three ones and each one of them had various defects. But by the way, the students were entertainingly horrified by my code. They said, what do you see your scoring engine? I said, oh boy. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, I might, not, I might be the only guy like this. I code like someone who just needs to get the answer as fast as possible and does not care. So all my scoring engine does is it creates lines of bash and executes them inside Python. And because I tried using the requests library and it used up all the memory on my server and crashed it. And I said, well, I'm going back to just creating lines of bash. All it does is um, curl web page, put it in a file, grep to see if it contains this word and put that number in a file, and that's the number of points. That's all it is. <laughs> you know, I, I learned this. You know, when I, when, I, when I first got a job in the financial sector at an escrow agency, I was from physics, and we had this lawsuit that said you get so many dollars for pain and suffering, so many dollars for missed um, promotions, and so many dollars for this, and so many dollars for that. So I wrote a code that would do this equation with like 10 terms and get the answer. The boss said, no, 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 that will never do. You have to have the data here and then calculate this component and put it in a line and this component and put it in a line and this and then add them up later because you have to make it so we can print it out and someone can go with a ruler and audit it to make sure it's right and i said oh i never thought of that and he said yeah that's the difference between physics and banking and the difference here is we have to actually get it right and you have to actually prove that it's right and i found that to be very informative and i learned to stop trying to be clever and start trying to get the right answer reliably which is a lot different than being clever Anyway, um, so that's good fun. And I think I'll mention one more thing since we have a little more time, which is my other big excitement is Splunk. I taught a class in network security monitoring using this textbook. Um, let me go to my old version too to compare it because maybe I can spare you making the mistake. Um, 
machine at 50, the first time I taught it, let me see if I can find it. Okay, first time I taught this class, like I usually do, I thought I would use a textbook. So I went and found this textbook from Richard Betlick, the practice of security modeling, which is about security onion. Has anybody used security onion? Did you like it? Yeah, I, ha I, learned, I came to hate it. Security Onion is the open source product to monitor the network and it is incredibly cool. It is using incredibly old stuff like Flash, which totally does not work anymore. Half the tools don't run, the other half crash all the time. I've had, if you have a room full of 10 students trying to do homework, five of them just die for no reason at all. It makes you cry. I learned a rule, Security Onion, the purpose of Security Onion is to torture you until you decide it's really okay to pay for Spunk. <laughs> It's probably okay for the guy that wrote it. I mean, we were the tool called Bro. For years, Bro had no documentation at all. The network security monitoring from, from Berkeley. He said, oh, just grab the source code if you want to know how it works. And I'm like, dude, what planet are you from? If you think I'm going to figure out how to use it for that. The point is, it's only for the people who made it. The same thing was true of, um, of Nginx, the best web server. It originally came out, there was, all the documentation was only in Russian because it was only used by Russian cyber criminals. Anybody using it for a legitimate purpose came through much later and was not the original use case. And so anyway, um, so I taught this class and we all suffered greatly through trying to use open source network security monitoring. And I finally gave up and got Splunk certification, which I highly recommend. So I totally threw that away. I'm teaching the class again. Now it is just Splunk certification. I highly recommend it. Splunk has these great training products, Boss of the Sock and Boss of the Knock. They're free online and they're live and you can go there and win trophies. We've won two trophies so far where you have real data from a real network with all these attacks going in and you search through it with Splunk to find it. Splunk is like Google for network data. You learn how to use it. You can say, where are the SQL injections? Where are the cross-site scripting? What is this server? How many people logged into this machine? How many people have been getting four or four errors on the web page? Who are they? When did that happen? Why did the web server go down? If you learn how to use it, you can answer all those. And it's not too hard. So I found this is a one unit course, one third of our normal size to just get this thing. Splunk course certified user. I got this. This is a very reasonable cert to have. People can totally get a job. I found out 85 of the top one, Fortune 100 are using Splunk. And Splunk is the number four highest paying company in America. That's, and they're local. And they're totally happy to help. I, I went to took the um, did the contest, which they have for free periodically. And my students went in and they said, oh, we'll come visit your class and run a contest or something. I said, great. So I'm trying to increase our partnership with Splunk because they're a local company, they're hiring, it's a good company, and their product really works. It's also really expensive. But I say, you, if you think it's expensive, just try using Security Onion and then tell me, reconsider. It's like, you know, people say, Linux is free, let's not pay for Windows. And I say, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> Put Linux on your desktop and see how much work you actually get done. And then consider human life is worth some money too. That's the thing. And if you install Splunk, it will actually work. Yeah. Oh, you don't need one. This is even more awesome. You can run Splunk for free up to a certain number of data per day, which is enough for training. No, forever. If you install Splunk, it's completely free up to like 500 megabytes of data a day, which is all you need. So you don't have to have a license for anything. It's the way every product should be. It has a free version. What's that? Oh, they've been through various, various. It has always been true. See, the way you do it for training is you don't monitor live data. The cool way to do training is you live have static data. And then there's no limit. But if you do monitor live data, you can only monitor a very small amount of data per day. So just a couple of machines in a test environment. But you can totally practice with it without any license or anything. In fact, they gave me some licenses when I asked, but I never had to use them. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're yeah, and that's what I'm going to use instead of a textbook, just their online free class. It's fine. It's sort of like the Cisco Academy. It's got homework lessons and everything. It's got little quizzes. It's really nice. I, I tried to find a book. All the books are terrible. So I said, forget it. I'm just going to use the official online class. That's going to be my textbook. And so I'm, uh, I'm converted. And I thought I'd tell you guys, too. I recommend it. People can totally get jobs with it. You know, I think when things are new, you have these open source experimental products. And when, when somebody comes to dominate, like Cisco, Microsoft, then you just bow before them and obey them. At least that's my philosophy. We're vocational education. Whatever people really use is what we have to use. And this is what people really use because you can really give this to an employee and they can actually get some value out of it. If you give them security onion, they'll just quit. Anyway, of course, uh, 
the security onion people like all open source people will say, well, all they're doing is imitating our open source product, which is pretty much true. It's doing the same thing security onion does. The only difference is it works. <laughs> yeah, but you know, in principle, just like the open office people, if in principle, it's all in the open source tool. It's just that nobody can use it, but that shouldn't count. And I said, well, that kind of does count. <laughs> to me, that counts. But in an abstract sense, I suppose they're just exploiting the poor developers of the open source products. Anyway, um, so I think that's all I had to show you. Um, so feel free to keep on working if you want to. And uh, these things will stay up so you can use them later. But I'm glad to see a lot of people got a few things going here. Hopefully you all got a cloud machine anyway. Which one was the Yeah, the red versus blue, that's on right. Uh, well, right now, those are really early versions, so I don't really recommend them too much, but if you want them, they're in my old classes in CNET 40. At the end of the semester, I made just a few of them here, but I'm gonna make better ones next semester. So I wouldn't recommend trying to use these yet. You could, but I think you'll not be impressed yet. Next, but I think I, it, proved, it proved to be enough of a prototype that I think the concept is good. And I'm planning to have a small local cyber competition practice like CCC, but much smaller, much more local, much simpler, without all the irritations. Because I'm hoping to make it so people can watch. In person or online? Well, I'll probably do both in person and online. But I mean, I want to make it so that there's a training, there's a thing you do in the classroom to get ready. And then when you show up, you won't be, uh, you know, you know your students are ready. Which is what really bothered me about CCDC. That prevented me from doing for years. I couldn't really get an answer for how I know my students are ready. And there's really no answer for that. And that's not right. I don't want to, if I send my students into a, the ring with Muhammad Ali to get squashed, that is not good for them. <laughs> I, I want to know what they're supposed to know so I can make a reasonable attempt to teach them that before I send them into a competition. I don't want them coming out feeling stupid and humiliated. So it is not unreasonable to say, tell me what your competition covers. Tell me what I have to do to get ready. There ought to be a textbook or something. If they know what's in this book, they'll be okay. They don't have to win, but they have to not be humiliated. And I'm hoping, I'm gonna make this that way. I'll have it next semester. I'll, I'll send out an email, let you guys know. This one here is in 140. It's in my old classes. But you know, like I say, they, right now, wait for a better version. Next semester, I'll have a better version on my homepage. Um, but it is in this class in my old, see it 140. It's, it's our CCDC class. We're, we're doing better in CCDC, but you know, it took me a couple of years to figure it out because CCDC, the only way to do it is to like jump in and get humiliated and sort of learn in combat what you should have done. And so you spend like two years being a fool before you begin to figure out how it works. And I would, I don't think that's necessary. I'm hoping to make a simpler contest no, probably won't be as famous or as important, but I, it'll be more appropriate for community college instructors who have no money and, you know. Can I think the red versus blue, I watch how the students do this in class, the red versus blue, and this is just what I want. But it's always CCDC for that matter. Students are really working, helping each other, doing a job, something that's very much like what they really do on the job. That's why I really think the red versus blue is the right way to do training. And, and now with Splunk, I know how to do it so that I can have known vulnerabilities and I can have a script for the red team to call and a script for the blue team to follow. I went to CactusCon, they had a script for the red team. They just did two or three attacks and they had a script for the blue team and everybody was having fun. And the guy next to me was a professional pen tester on the red team. He was not complaining that this is too easy. It was, it was not, it was really nice. You can do it and watch it and it's good for you. It's not too hard. So um, these don't quite have good enough scripts yet, but I'm going to have more of that next semester. Anyway, that's what I wanted to show you. Yeah, I'll give it to you. Uh, well, I have a certificate for you. Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, giving us a whole bunch of information. Yeah, I hope you find something useful there, folks. And I'll stick around to help people until they kick me out, which I guess will be 20 minutes. I'm going to stop this recording, which may or may not be any good, but I will put a recording up. Some people said they wanted to.